Uh, I'm Daniel. Uh, just a second. Okay, so this meeting is being recorded. Um, so hello everybody, welcome to another HMI event. And I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. So we are gathered here as a collective of learners at Hunter College, which was found on the unceded land of the Lanapi people. We acknowledge that Hunter College was founded upon exclusion and erasure of many indigenous peoples. We honor with gratitude the land itself and acknowledge our ongoing occupation as well as the colonial theft and genocide of indigenous peoples. We commit to continue to learn and to be better stewards of the land we inhabit and support the rights of indigenous peoples worldwide. And um, okay, and now um, I would like to read a short bio, uh, bio about Liz and I'll pass the mic to um, SGP and maybe some people here haven't been in an HMII event before so I'll just say that we start with uh, 30 minutes of um, a discussion between Liz and SGP and then we um, open um, yeah the possibility for a Q&A so you're welcome also along the talk to write in the chat and we could either read it to you, uh, to everyone, or you could uh, read it yourself as you wish. Um, okay, so Liz Magic Laser is a multimedia artist from New York City. Her performance and video-based installation work has involved collaborations with political strategies, market researchers, journalists, actors, dancers, therapists, surgeons, and motorcycle gang members. Her most recent project in real life, commissioned by FACT Liverpool UK, the handle Poignet, commissioned by Centre Pompidou in Paris, explored the um, efficiency of um, new, age, uh, new age techniques and psychological methods used both in cooperate culture and political movements. Her work has been shown in, um, at venues such as Kunsthalle Baden-Baden, Saint Pompidou Paris, Fly Art Museum Seattle, um, Metro Pictures New York, Swiss Institute, the, uh, the Whitney Museum of uh, American Art, Listen Gallery in London, the Preforma 11 Biennale in New York, at MoMA PS1 New York, and more. She had solo exhibitions in uh, France, Scotland, uh, the Netherlands, at the uh, Paula Cooper Gallery in New York in uh, Sweden and the, just uh, this is just to name few and uh, Stenberg Press published her monograph uh, public relation in conjunction with her solo show at the Wester Fleischer Kunstverein in Germany I hope I said it uh, pretty close Laser is um, the recipient of grants and awards from New York Art Foundation uh, New York Foundation of Arts Fellowship and Franklin uh, Fran uh, France for Performance Art. Again, just to name a few. And her um, upcoming show, um, Possession, is going to be a sculptural and performance-based collaboration with Arena Reines, uh, opens at Pioneer Works in uh, 2023. So that's something to wait for. And uh, now I'm passing the mic to SPG. Um, which is uh, a member of the um, HMII and uh, anti-disciplinary artist. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. Um, hi, Liz. Nice to see you. Nice to see everybody here. And um, I think that the conversation will just be open so that as people trickle in, they can kind of happen wherever. Um, as I mentioned um, in an email we had, I'd like to start these conversations kind of with like a sacred profane dichotomy doing a coin toss. I have a really like bimbo-tastic question, which I think is super powerful. And then I have a super petty research-based question. So we'll see what heads or tails um, yeah, which direction we start with, just because I think there's a lot you have to say and a lot that leads different places. So um, Tails is the 
profane question <laughs> and heads is the sacred question. So let's see. Oh my God. It's tails, like every time I've done this. So if you had to describe uh, your favorite artificial scent or flavor, how would you describe it? That's how we're going to start. <laughs> well, I had a favorite perfume for years that was discontinued. It was called Big Leaf, made by Fresh. And, uh, but I think they probably stopped making it something like, uh, I, I, wow. I wore it in 2008, that's all I can remember. And I still, that is the perfume. I don't know if it's artificial. I mean, what's the, it's in, you bring up something. My, I have a five-year-old daughter and she did actually just start um, pointing things out to me last, uh, night before last in the bathroom asking, where does that color come from? Where does that color from come from? And that there was only one supposedly quote unquote natural color I could point to. And then I was explaining to her, you know, you dye things with goldenrod at school and that's a naturally derived color. Um, and most of the things you're pointing at here, like the toothpaste, uh, can, the red on the toothpaste uh, tube, for instance, these are artificially derived in a, like a potion, like potion making in a laboratory. But then it goes back to this, you know, issue of, oh, but it's all a spectrum because we're from nature and we're animals and we made it. So I couldn't quite get to a, a, a reductive way of explaining what synthetic means exactly. So, um, but that's the first thing I thought of was the fig leaf and I replaced it. Everyone told me that um, a well-known bougie brand called Diptyque makes a, a fig perfume. So I replaced it with that when they discontinued fig leaf, which was really unique to me. People said, uh, some of my friends called me my back, I remember back in 2008, which is maybe the last time I remember seeing you regularly, Daniel. Was, I was at Skowhegan the summer of 2008 and I remember I had one or two close friends and they who called me their best smelling friend and it was all because of that um that fig leaf that was discontinued and then I replaced it with with the uh fig from Diptyque for a bit but it was the most generic expensive thing so it was over a hundred I think it was a hundred dollars a bottle which was maybe three times the price of fresh. And then everyone recognized it, which was so lame to have. Anyway, so um, you it's, actually triggered something unexpectedly. <laughs> totally, totally. I mean, the, so uh, I, have no, I have no scent except for my own scent. Now I do a lemon natural deodorant and that's the closest thing too. So uh, there's synthesized by humans, but they're on the natural end of the artificial spectrum, I suppose. Yeah. It's funny because Diptyque is, I guess, one of the more visible uh, olfactory scents, but they're also like the most toxic when it comes to like tap candles. And, um, mm. But I think this might actually be a nice sort of uh, gradient into talking about reality TV and sort of like artificial versus real or scripting the real and kind of, um, I guess, certain scents become real because they employ only pheromones, right? Which Diptyque does not do. Um, I feel like most scents that get discontinued exclusively employ like pheromones, but it's too expensive. Um, so yeah, I would love to kind of transition maybe into a conversation about reality TV mm -hmm. from here. If you want to take it away, talking about IRL, which is what we all sort of like sat down and watched. Yeah. And I do have questions about the 
how it was supposed to be five channels versus watching them consecutively, but we can get to that. Sure. Um, and I and I do have a few images from the first installation of it that I can show to to explain uh, that as well. And yeah, you did um, stimulate some thoughts about um, just now about I suppose taste and lowest common denominator taste versus having something particular and unusual. And um, I don't have a linear, precise uh, uh, connection to, to the piece as of yet, but there is definitely something there with you know, reality television being something that is American mass public appeal. Um, it's both, everyone is, uh, it casts a really wide net for who it, um, who it can hail or intrigue. And yet it's also really uh, boring and cliche and repetitive. Um, and so it's usually the formula, the overarching formula that is a conceptual artwork and premise. It's only that it's for uh, mass entertainment, but it really the, the logic and the approach for it um, is, uh, you know, only, there's only contextual difference of, in terms of, you know, how a, how a setup for a reality show. Yeah. Of. Not to cut, keep, keep going. I'm, I'm just vocalizing and unmuted, so. Um, no, perfect, please keep yourself unmuted. I'd rather, oh, yeah. I'd, I'd, yeah. rather have it. <laughs> I'd rather have this be conversational. So, yeah. There was a moment, um, or I guess multiple moments where, um, and I'll come back to the more like heady question that was the flip side of the coin. Uh, but I guess there were multiple moments in IRL specifically that it also feels very different from most of your other work that I've encountered. I guess you're working with a group and kind of, um, or working with and through a group. But there was definitely moments in the I'll Be episode where you saw um, Cardi's reflection basically in every other like cutaway scene. And it seemed like he was really heavily scripting that episode in a way that, um, I don't know, it just felt like there was a tangible presence. And I, I'm curious about how you were navigating scripting reality television, working with uh, these freelancers. And I have a big question about material reality versus philosophical reality um, that I kind of felt when I was watching um, Katie's like reflection and just being hyper aware of your position as the artist creating all of these things and how much money it cost and how many jobs the freelancers lost. And so I was kind of curious about um, how you tried to meet these material conditions that seem to be a philosophical preoccupation of the work or if that was something that just kind of happened too quickly for you to keep track of? Well, um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to answer your question, but I am aware that maybe I should explain the project briefly first, because okay. I don't know that everyone watched it. And then I'll, I'll, I'll get to that because yeah, the, you know, the short or I'll, the short answer is that the institution was um, dead set on having very clear contracts with everyone and was in, um, prohibitively concerned about um, overstepping the boundaries or this work being um, con too controversial or um, unethical. So to the point that it, the, the whole production was delayed by two months because they couldn't, um, they didn't have legal counsel, but they knew they needed very clear contracts. And so 
Um, this was actually, you know, a project that involved a lot of um, challenges with the institutional conversation, I'll say. Yeah, yeah um, sure. So, so I, I, I'm not um, positive, but I think that it was definitely uh, a more involved process and endeavor than anyone expected it to be. Mm. And, um, and I did end up um, continuing after the fact and I filmed more and edited more for the second time that I showed this which is the version that you saw. Um, and so I did pay everyone more um, out of pocket um, mm -hmm. for that ongoing participation. And um, yeah, I think it's, I think that they, that most of the participants involved um, had both feelings about it at different times, that it was too much or that it was, really fun and worthwhile mm -hmm. and um and uh of course that rides along as well uh socioeconomic mm -hmm. lines you know i think for um a lobby we mentioned who um out of anyone was maybe doing it more for the gig um mm -hmm. and he said so himself and um you know maybe it was a little more annoying for him, but he also found it quite in, uh, worthwhile and intriguing. And that's why I made a point with him to um, get him more swag sent to him. There were extra things that uh, didn't really figure into the premise. Like I, I was like, I think he, you know, he said he wanted a Wycom tablet, so I, well, that's interesting. Let's get him a Wycom tablet. It doesn't totally fit into the premise, but we can but it's uh, send him a Wycom tablet in Nigeria. Yeah, the, um, what you're saying is very interesting because the way you're describing it feels so counter to how it was presented, where it was like the Wacom tablet was a part that was pre-configured into his like biohacking situation. Do you want me to share... Uh, do you want to share some images? I mean, I yes. just, I'll, yeah. I'll do a screen share. Okay, I'll, I I'm, have some, I have some material to show. Yeah, so, and, and a big, a big question I have about this project specifically is about aftercare. I know like there's the voiceover line that's like your next gig is to pursue whatever in your real life. But I kind of wonder what other structures of support. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and these are all so different from the video too. So I'm like curious. I think it's really interesting how this project does match the material conditions to the philosophy. Like you are technically paying these people certain things, but I'm. Yeah, I guess I have hangups about bodies in space and um, yeah, where yeah, well where that, is, that is where the yeah, where the whole premise came from for me. So uh, so so now backing up, I think it was probably fall of twenty seventeen where I got a solicitation to. Uh, make a proposal for this place called Fact in Liverpool, UK. It's um, a you know art and technology foundation. I think the closest thing in New York City would be if um, IFC and something like Sculpture Center were combined. So there's a film house, there's a cafe, there's an art space. Um, they have quite a large team actually. You know, they have more people on the educational outreach team than they do on the exhibition team. So it's, um, it, it seemed like maybe 30 or 40 people work in this office for what is that actually a fairly small exhibition space, but they do a lot of things in the public realm and it's multifaceted. 
So they were doing a year long program on the future of work. And they had eight categories and many different types of projects and residencies and uh, educational programs in schools um, with, with children, both in their schools and at the foundation and so on. Um, and this was for the central commission of this year long project. And so they had asked, I don't know if it was eight or 10 artists, they said here, you know, they offered a few hundred pounds to come up with a proposal. And I think they, you know, they sent as well a 30 or 40 page prospectus on the different areas of the future of work. And they, and they had eight categories and the eighth category was the gig economy. And I, I also should just mention, I think this came out of Liverpool being, having this history of dock workers unions and labor strikes and it being uh, a, you know, a pretty, politically active uh, bastion historically. So, um, so the eighth category was the gig economy and, and this um, touched something off for me having used things like um, Fiverr and TaskRabbit intermittently over the preceding handful of years for little things we need to clean up the sound from a performance video, you know, from the video of a theatrical performance last minute, you know, uh, and it's gonna be one of many things in an exhibition and the, the sound's awful and I need it in two days. So it would go on Fiverr, I think, but I think strangely the very first time I used a service like TaskRabbit or Fiverr, it was to test out a child's voiceover. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I confronted the um, the oddness and the limits of this anonymous kind of uh, ghost work collaboration with others right away because I was asking, I was speaking to parents and trying to get them to direct their amateur children to read a um, a theoretical voiceover text for an ice skating film. I had done in 2014, 2015. Uh, so, but I had, a, when I read this prospectus, I had, it made me recall this very uncanny experience of, of um, online shopping for units of human labor. And, yeah. it being, and it being quite DIY and odd and you didn't really know where someone was or who, if they were who they say they are, um, if it was one person or three or 20. Yeah. And, um, and I, it gave me quite an uneasy feeling. And yet it was still, what else can you buy from people on here? A strange telegram from from a field in India of someone dressed up with pineapples on their head, you know, it was also the sort of logic of the singing telegram mm -hmm. by a amateur video. So there were things like that, but predominantly it was for corporate aesthetics. It was for, um, for an in, what, you know, it seems like these um, sites like um, People Per Hour and Upwork and Fiverr were created for is um, all about greater access to becoming an entrepreneur. That's what they're selling to the client and right. then to the, to, um, to the sellers who are also clients, they're selling this, this dream of, uh, of also of entrepreneurship of being um, a tech savvy freelancer of the 20th yeah, or, century. Or competitively, um, again, it's like competitively cheap labor. I guess I also had, 
Maybe with most of your work, but it feels like IRL specifically. And I, I'm curious if you, how you might reconfigure things like post COVID, post Zoom reality. I know you started doing all of this before like quarantine and lockdown. And so it's, I, I'm curious about how maybe um, ethics or time or just like preoccupations have shifted. Uh, a, a big question that I have about this is that you kind of get the feel of Fiverr or Upwork or these um, platforms that purport to be super like equalizing. You kind of get the insidious nature of it or the insidious like potential of it. The, the project never really takes a stance. It definitely seems like you're more invested in asking questions and as opposed to like providing solutions. And I think letting the aesthetic of the video be taken away from you and like employing people to, you know, mm -hmm. do that. But then I, was, you know, you do have say over the original, uh, over the final like physical installation. So I'm kind of curious about how these things um, conflict or not for you in your brain. Yes, I think that this project proved to me that I wasn't just saying before this, I think I generally did follow through with my premise and my point of view mm. for the conceit of a work. It would maybe shift slightly, but this is the first time where um, my critique, it um, through the process of, of doing the work, um, fell flat. I didn't, they convinced me that it wasn't as insidious or that it was of course insidious but, and they were beholden to stay up all night juicing themselves for, you know, some dentist's infomercial or, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, startups website and so on. So of course it's all of the um, insidious bureaucratic banality of evil impressions remain. Mm -hmm. And at, at the end of the day, I couldn't, I had to as well recognize that um, this movement was uh, also giving greater access to um, to a burgeoning creative class in the developing world. And it was bad for um, first world Western uh, graphic designers or web developers because their rates were going down, but that it might be primarily a good thing for someone like Zahid in Pakistan or a lobby in, in Nigeria. And I had to check myself through this process of many interviews with each person where I'd be like, don't you want to be out there playing, playing football? You don't want to spend all of your time on your computer, on your bed. And, you, and you'd be like, eh. and then I'd ask, what do you do with your free time? And he would say he plays real player video games. And it's like, okay, you're, I'm projecting what, what, you know, not even my own values, but what I think the correct values should be. Mm -hmm. And um, that has um, that isn't um, the pro, you know, that doesn't line up with the proclivities and desires of, of others. Yeah, I'm cur I'm just curious about how it uh, might have 
it's just very interesting to me that these points of view, like your changing perspective or changing point of view is absent from the, I'm just kind of like, how do you visualize that in a film or, um, it's interesting because because the stills you're showing for some reason the wheel of life boxes are reminding me of jewelry boxes which is just also super like specific um but I guess a big question that I have around your practice as a whole and this project specifically which I feel like has material conditions that can provide an exit to sort of like academic or even freelance conditions with which like freelance as a word is super dangerous because anything that has free in the name is just like I don't know it automatically accessible yeah <laughs> people just assume and um it's interesting what you're saying about the different rates but what would you maybe, um, or what are your feelings about, also sorry for the insiderness of the question I'm about to ask, but what are your feelings about um, Andrea Frazier's 2005 Art Forum essay about institutional critique sort of becoming a new normal? Uh, the title of it is, uh, an in, a, from the critique of institutions to an institution of critique. So I'm curious about how your relationship to institutional critique, especially in your education, um, has informed your practice and kind of where you feel you might fall um, in that, um, especially with this work. Mm -hmm. Well, it's if I have, it's possible I read that article. I'm not. Sorry. Sure. Again, but sorry. If I, have, if I did, it would have been <laughs> in 2005, six or seven. <laughs> I, did, I did write. Um, she is, her work is definitely um, near and dear to my, to the development of, of, um, to my development. So, um, and I, and I did in graduate school, write an essay about, about, um, her untitled piece. I had a feeling where she, feeling. you know, had intercourse with the collector and had the, the gallery be the pimp. Um, and that was, a that piece in particular was a bit of a primal scene for me because I saw it in the gallery in, mm. in 2003 mm. by, by chance. I was meeting some, a friend in Chelsea and I was wandering around and I wandered in there and I, I thought that it was about making strangers watch amateur porn together. I had no idea what it was and I picked up the press release. You know, I sat there, I watched for a bit with one or two other strangers and it just happened to be all people who were there alone. And so it was awkward and funny. And I love that. Um, <laughs> and then I picked up the press release and read it as I walked down the street and was, and was outraged and thought it was complete bullshit. And, um, and then I found myself ranting and raving about it for weeks afterwards until I got to a point where I thought where I said it can I did a pretty um immediate 180 mm. and and decided if I'm still talking about this yeah there you go <laughs> nobody else no one else I'm talking to about this even saw it or knows what I'm talking about so why so it's really there's something there. there. Yeah, there's there's some something needy there, and um, and so um, when I was in graduate school for making art, I um, I realized I hadn't taken that much contemporary art history, so I did, and and had and she was covered in this feminism and postmodernism class I took with Rosalind Deutsch, and um, and I decided I I to dig into that. 
Yeah. So I probably did read it back back then, but I don't have any clear recollection of that one. I remember being more preoccupied with this. Why does spread sand back make me cry? Uh, yeah, I also years. agree. 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 I say. I guess it's just it's kind. It feels very related to anyone making work after like. 2008, especially like institution critical works that are trying to bring in more emotion or like humanism. Uh, and it just is definitely something that I am always thinking about and reminds me of, of your work and kind of like, how do you ride that line when institutional critique is kind of now easily canonized or like it's a the rage is like digestible in a yeah way. it's a it's a moot point yeah <laughs> and so you could argue yeah. so is any style yeah you choose and no style or you know codified approach or template is um is a uh, more avant-garde is more valuable or worthwhile than any other. I really, it just as, you know, abstract painting versus figurative painting. It's not, an individual will tend towards one, ten, you know, tendency or style, you know, versus another, but yes, for sure. Institutional critique is no more, um, well, I was about to say it has no more teeth than abstract painting, but I don't really think that's true. Yeah, I don't. I, I think don't. It's, there's an intention there to to have some um, antagonism, and um, versus the there are, you know are many approaches that that's just not what it's interested in about or about or trying to instigate with the viewer or the outside world or the context. Um, and, and I did, and I have had, you know, even more dramatic, you know, I think the most intensely institutional critique project I ever did was for the Armory show. And it was I very, wanted to talk it was about, very painful. Yeah, I wanted to talk about that, actually, and um, kind of where, how these potential like failures of institutional critique or like w setting up a workshop that then becomes futile. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk about frustration and failure, especially because you're working in this sort of like inside outside mode. And we are kind of starting to open it up to public Q and A. So if people have questions that they thought of or are thinking of, Drop it in the chat, um, but. And I'm also gonna quickly just interject and, and answer one of your first questions. About oh yeah, the, Sorry, about there was the a installation. Lot. Yeah. So um, this was the initial installation at FACT. I'll also just back up to say it's um, a, rea a, a five episode reality show slash mini series about five different types of gig workers from around the world. They, um, each episode is about 22 minutes and all of the participants were um, um, actually part of the, they all participated in producing all of the episodes for themselves and one another. So for instance, um, the figure in the center is Kiki Wong from Hong Kong and she um, uh, was providing voiceover services on Fiverr specifically for um, automated response system calls. So she has a um, convincing mechanical voice and, um, and she does the voiceover for all five episodes and speaks about herself in the third person when it's her episode. And a lobby on the left is an a animator who only does um, whiteboard animations, which is where the hand comes in and draws things on the screen. And he um, provided illustrations at my direction for all five episodes. So that was the premise. They all were, it was somewhat modeled after a sort of queer eye for the straight guy. 
um, um, makeover show where I gave them all uh, a um, biohacking life coach and a psychic to um, make over their, um, their working methods to maximize their efficiency and give them more leisure time and um, help them promote their careers to the next level if that's what they wanted. Um, and I gave them all tech devices. The most um, extreme one was Cardi on the, on the right hand side, you see him with the glasses. And um, I gave him, he was struggling with his goals and his initial biohacking device or his, his initial assignment was to do Wim Hof breathing techniques and cold showers every morning. Which was so different from what everybody else. Yes. To do. And, and, it, and it was, oh, and he was also supposed to use Focus at Will, a music app that has, you know, different, uh, different kinds of sounds fashioned for different um, personality types. There's, you know, uh, house uh, intense, you know, Burkheim house mu music for ADHD people and, you know, atmospheric. Uh, um, cinematic atmospheric sounds for other types to help you focus um but nothing was really working for him and I uh gave him a um a, a wristband in the end that shocks you if you don't do what you mean to do and it was a little complicated about how it functioned but in order to have it usually you were supposed to just shock yourself which takes a lot of willpower, but it did have a function. And he's specifically a, a screenwriter for television and was trying to write a novel. And so it did have a function where um, if you were trying to write in, Google, um, in a Google Drive document, if you clicked out of the tab or you know were idle for too long, it would shock you automatically. So we used that on him, which was perhaps the most um, cynical, e evil, funny device that someone got. Um, okay, oh yeah, so the premise of the um, installation was a binge watching scenario where each episode played one after the next in a round robin. And um, while one episode played, the other four people were up on screen, were each up on their own screen. Mm -hmm. And I had had them record themselves for, in, for about an hour and a half working at their computer just through their webcam. So I called it a sort of screensaver of them endlessly working. And it was meant to give this sort of we work scenario. You also, I also had kept the ambient sounds playing out of their speakers. So in that, this case, it meant hearing. I don't know if Zoom actually might cancel these sounds, but I don't know. <laughs> Can you hear? <laughs> you know. You can't hear anything right now because Zoom cancels it's typing sounds. Or if but you basically, mute yourself and just share the what? If you mute yourself and just um, I don't know that might work. If not, then we can just type. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> and you get the idea. The point is, you heard everyone typing and clicking, and their phone would ring, or their child or dog would interrupt, and it actually made you feel like um, there were more people in the room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were there with went at a time when there weren't that many other people that you often thought, you know, it was, it was convincingly surprising for people at a telephone would ring and they would think it was another viewer, but it was the other workers. Then there were also moments, um, a lot of the more uh, game show style moments in the episodes um, interrupted the screensavers and it played on all of the screens. So when um, the um, contestant was um, was uh, addressed directly, like Nikki, congratulations, Nikki, you have completed your 30 day biohacking challenge that played visually and um, orally on all of the screens and speakers. So it gave you this uh, game show feel and uh, interruption change of pace in the scenario. Oh yeah, and then the cushions <coughs> were based, excuse me, the cushions for each person was um, based on their 
um, coaching intake form where they had to assess their levels of satisfaction in the various areas of life, love, money, so on. Yeah, I feel like a big part of where the kind of moral ambiguity comes in is when the biohacking and psychic come into the frame, like, cause, cause I feel like triangulating these three things is a specific move, but, and if anybody has questions, please jump in. I have so many questions. I'm happy to talk to Liz forever, but um, yeah, I'm a little bit curious about that. And I'm also wondering kind of just about the action of like sitting on someone's aspirations <laughs> or just like the, these cushions are like, I, I don't know. I'm also one trying to put my body in that space and wondering if I would like lie on the ground or sit on a cushion or stand and watch and um, yeah. Yeah, I, I think you're throwing me back to what one of the things that first came up when you brought up Andrea Frazier's work as well for me, which I think is the thing about um, The thing, the thing about her work that I identify with most is this um, coinciding of cynicism and authenticity, and I, and I think that's what was um, why you know I still remember you know, that essay about about crying and specifically um, it always will stick with me these performance the these figures, you know, another one somewhat, for some reason, someone mentioned cat power to me today. They met her recently and it's like, oh yeah, that also always intrigued me. She was someone in the early 2000s who, who would cry, break down crying on stage quite often. And that seemed really authentic and not performed. Um, and it was really, um, I was very taken with um, the, um, I don't know if it was the lack of embarrassment or just the carrying through. It's like that show, the show must go on. That, that sort of those moments and those performances of, of breakdown that are both a rupture and part of the and show. Like theatrically smoking a cigarette, like post breakdown yeah. recovering. And it's like, yeah. yeah. Um, and, that, and that's also what um, attracted me to working with reality television is specifically the confessional. And this is basically all confessional. It's um, all, it, I'm like, it's so LA, cat power confessional. But um, I know that Daniel has <laughs> a question. So maybe we can just throw, unless you have something that directly points to that. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all feeling very LA confessional. I, and I've never lived in LA. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I don't love watch, that. and I love actually it. don't watch reality TV. I love that. Love all of that. <laughs> Daniel, it's your, it's taken away. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, gosh, Liz, honestly. Um, I'm, I'm glad actually we're, we're kind of starting from that point of the, of the, the show must go on kind of mm -hmm. uh, versus Raptor and how those things are maybe opposites, maybe they're not. Maybe the show going on is at the main Rapture. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just very curious to hear your experience with your own work after you, you have certain kind of setup of ideas that go into the work and the work gets produced and whatever. And then I'm sure there is some period later where the work is already there and it starts functioning in the world and at that point, you know, your actual experience with that, what that in a way delivered, how it functions, whatever. But uh, mm -hmm. so that's the question, but I'm almost like a specifically thinking about this idea of like a, you know, how the semi-capitalism has its own circular logic, which is, um, you know, unstoppable. You know, everything is folded, folding mm -hmm. into this kind of like a, whatever you might call work or free, Time work of you know it's that that type of re reconfirming sort of circular logic mm -hmm. is omnipotent and we all live in it in a way, and I feel like that the work I mean the, the particularly the, the work we're talking about 
in a, in a weird way, kind of like a, not only captures, but kind of in a strange way, kind of perpetuates that logic or kind of uses it and kind of writes over it in a way. And at the same time, I have a very intense experience that you have found some sort of like, through the work itself, some kind of actually that circular logic is some somewhat short circuited somewhere there. Yes. And I don't know if it's in the repetition, is it in the weird kind of holding uh, triple observation and mm -hmm. inevitability, uh, how Foster talks about this kind of mimetic exacerbation when several times you fold a certain kind of like procedure, it's not kind of canceling itself and it creates, creates this kind of weird warps mm. and places of autonomy and freedom. So I'm very curious to hear your experience with how the work functions that way in relationship who, to, yeah, go ahead. Who, who says that mimetic how, exacerbation? I love it. How, how Foster, how Foster. How Foster, there is ah, book, yeah, there is, there is he a says it about pop, about pop art. Right. No, I've, I've heard not him talk about, about pop art, art as this uh, exacerbation of of yeah. dominant culture. Uh, not only about pop art. He actually, in mm -hmm. particular, this particular article, he talks about Thomas Hirschhorn. But about but what? Thomas 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 Hirschhorn, the oh, artist. Thomas Hirschhorn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who is not a pop artist, I would say yes. at all. But like, anyway, True. I mean, he deals with a popular culture and that kind of the popular culture observing itself and creating these pockets of this kind of warped images of itself. But I'm just curious about your experience about that kind of spaces of autonomy that the work potentially creates from that circular logic by by re, I mean, somehow replaying it and kind of replaying yeah. it in a slightly different, uh, yeah. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit if you? Um, sorry, I just wanted to stop the screen share so we could see yeah. faces fully. Um, yeah, so many questions that uh, you, you touched many different things off. Um, so let me collect my thoughts. That um, approach that uh, that I think I did see him speak about Andy Warhol um, some years back, and him use that that term. How Foster used that term uh, exacerbation, and it did yeah. really stick with me or click with. Ah, uh, yeah, they, or I identified with it and I think at that time I often talked about before yeah I don't often use that I use that in speaking about other artwork but not my own mm -hmm. and I see what and and perhaps it does apply here um I, I used to I don't know what my vernacular for it is anymore it used to be critique from a position of of complicity was at least you know 12 years ago 10 years ago I knew what to what to call it. And I felt very much, you know, it was sort of more power to you if you are feel outside the system and feel self-righteous, good for you, but I don't totally buy it. And I can't claim that position. I am I'm a sucker for the dominant culture and all of its tricks, even though I know better or should know better. And that is what did and I think still fascinates me is we can be, um, we can spend our lives becoming more and more attuned to, uh, to visual language, to rhetorical, the aesthetics of rhetoric and uh, look at, um, and be well aware of our, the, all the market research and um, money that goes into engineering public opinion and individual op opinion. And when we're actually experiencing the thing or exposed to the film, TV, uh, web, you know, web post opinions relayed, um, we're, we're, we still, um, fall victim to it. And, you know, I would, and I, I we're seeing, you know, I'm hesitant to get into, to bring it to Ukraine, but I, I've been very aware with, with this right now, every, everyone being so ready to jump on the, the bandwagon of, 
um, images of, of violent heroicism. And, um, and I don't have the, I don't claim to have, again, it's like, I don't claim to have the answers of what, you know, of course I do have opinions about what should ha be happening and isn't happening. And um, I'm not gonna get into it with Ukraine right now. However, um, yeah, that's the most recent example that's, that's irking me to see, you know, inc you know, all of the incredibly intelligent people I know swept up in, the, in uh, the fantasy. And it's so clear to me that it's from all of this, the film and television and everything we've been spoon fed our whole lives. And, um, and it's not, to, of course, and it's such that we're convinced of what, you know, that support means, um, means weapons. And we get on board with the, the dominant uh, visual cultural experience of, of video games and movies. And, um, and we're all, you know, susceptible to crying. You know, I cried to uh, Encanto and I was embarrassed and then relieved to hear other, you know, parents say they had too. And it's like, oh yeah, of course, Disney has the best, you know, emotional engineers, market research at work. And I have Lin-Manuel Miranda on it and they, um, so um, I think what I am endlessly fascinated with and my pro and what the most consistent thing about my project or projects has been is, um, is that critique is not enough. We know we'll not I'm very fixated, fixated on what you said about like being a sucker and how that might be a way out. And um, I definitely, there's a lot to what you just said, but I know that we're ending mm -hmm. soon-ish. Uh, but I'm yeah. curious about, yeah, being a sucker and sort of ways out. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I think yeah, uh, this mimetic yeah. exacerbation term is in a way of of more clearly, you know, under wrapping our heads around it. It does make sense, but I don't. I think I got caught up in that term, and I don't know if I actually answered any of your other of your questions, Daniel. No, no, no. Uh, I, I think it, it it just it's not a question to be actually yeah. uh, bottom line, yeah. sort of like a finalized in any way I'm just curious about more like experience you know like a, as I said like a because the work has stages of yeah. your initial intent and also you have like a a year later when the work is actually meet with different audience meet with uh, yes. different context so at some point it's not kind of accumulating its own sort of like actual track of totally. what it does you know so I was asking about that I mean mimetic is just one of the mm -hmm. options here and it's already yes. kind of uh, you know well defined by a October magazine intellectual, mm -hmm. you know, who yeah. has a, also very different politics. And mm -hmm. uh, it's funny when you were talking about Liverpool, uh, Liverpool had like a, at some point when Margaret Thatcher was actually a, a, a kind of in power, he had the Trotskyist government, city government. It was far out like talking and about was, labor politics. And, and it was punished so yeah. severely economically. Right. But it still, was, for three yeah. for three years, they managed to build schools while she was like almost closing the union or so whatever. Yeah. So there was this kind of, uh, it, it, not that you did this for Liverpool, but like a, it just reminded me these kind of ideas of like when you have like a, the old Marxist left kind of way of dealing with that by naming things and by actually establishing a practice that is very mm -hmm. clear and then you follow it and then you uh, resist and, and all that, which might be still possible and somewhere or something. And now how this is different. And, and, and I'm, I'm just curious, my question was more like, how is yeah. it different from your experience of the work yeah. acquiring this kind of residue? Yes, of I often feel like 
the the work that I've made is some kind of Frankenstein slash unhinged child that I have no control over after the fact. I have a lot of control and I, while I'm, you know, or I, um, it's more like I, I spin out on trying to control it while I'm making it. But when you do something like this with the, the, that involves so many other people in their real lives or the market research focus groups I did for the, with the Armory Show VIPs, um, which also involved was perhaps the, uh, the previous, the only other previous more, no, I did a few things. Yeah. I also did a primal therapy group, which, um, as which you said, like, you attended a workshop related to. Which was this other like story. very specific failure, which is like another, yeah, but mm -hmm. I don't know if, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, this project, oh, another thing I didn't get to say is I did have an ulterior motive with this project. I thought that I was going to get it on to um, Netflix or, <laughs> or like Vimeo, Vimeo staff picks or something. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, thought yeah. this is my, I, I've had a pipe dream when I have been totally disillusioned with the art world such that I think I'm, I'm done with it and I need to do something else. It's been, oh, I wanna make TV. And so that is actually where the, the genesis of wanting to do a reality show came from. And I wrote treatments back in 2015 and I talked to, a, you know, I was working with a producer who from and nobody Games nobody who approached it. me and it never went anywhere. And then I also thought at a certain point had to face up to that all of these ideas were too boring or too out there and arty. And that only the um, creative field was going to help me make any of these things happen. I feel like but so there is part, perhaps a vanilla dimension that is um, that is a failure, is disappointing to, to the project. And then I would try to bring the critique or the edge back at different points, you know, and I brought everyone together for these uh, cast parties where they complained about me and complained about that. Like, it was like, come on, can say the worst things you can say. Well, I'm kind staff of- party, because I had to bring some of, of the, um, of the negativity back because some of the episodes, some of the episodes are quite positive and some are not. I would say the Zahid episode, the um, um, graphic designer in Pakistan is very positive. And then I would say the, that Alavi in Nigeria is more cynical and that's, you know, because this positive vanilla template of, of a reality TV is just like stamped. It's like I insisted on stamping it on the same way, no matter what the reality is. And there, that is violent. And it isn't, it is, it, the ethics of it are questionable. I really do want, I feel like, I'm curious what it would be like if you were to repitch it this mm -hmm. year. I really feel mm -hmm. like there's sort of this like, yeah, I know we have to wrap up, yeah. but I'm- Yeah, I'm just- the, I'm the, sorry the, Oh yeah, so that is what you keep at, you know, hinting at, which is, I forgot to say is we made it on Zoom in 2019. And so then it was quite strange right. too. Yeah. yeah, I think I used Zoom for the first time in 2018 to do a breath work. A workshop where you hallucinate from hyperventilating in the research for this project wow. and then we this was what the life coach used this was what all of the sort of corporate yeah. new age fusion practitioners were using already and for years a few years so that's what we used to make it and then it was quite odd too um well, yeah, to be on back it. on there and to also <laughs> feel that that all of our lives were becoming more like what I was presenting as somewhat of a tech driven shut in lifestyle. Totally. Totally.
And so with that note, <laughs> yes. uh, we'd like to thank you all for joining us. And thank you, SGP, for hosting and Liz for joining. And yeah, thank you, everybody else, for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you all. Yeah. For thank you. Yeah. And see you soon. Yeah, this was really fun. Thanks yeah. for yeah, everything. I really, I really enjoyed hashing it up together <laughs> and the more questions were epic sgp they were amazing i didn't want to butt in because i was just like i you're in a flow and i just want to hear it <laughs> yeah got a lot yeah see you. Okay. really good to see you too Bye. all right and good night y'all thank you bye, bye everybody bye. Thank you, Liz. bye bye yeah liz i hope to see you soon at some point yes uh, let's please. keep Keep trying to okay. find this was this was incredible. Thank you. Thank so much. you. I really, it was really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank Thanks. you. See Thanks you soon. soon. Bye. Bye. Carlos, thanks a lot. You're welcome, Daniel. That was that was good. We're we're eating eggs and rice over here. And this is sunny. That's Lee. Hello. Hey. Nice to see your face in this kind of some weird tiny screen situation. Um, so, okay, uh, we'll, yeah, we'll move on, but like, uh, thanks a lot. I'll, I'll see you soon. <laughs>